Uh, okay. Hi guys. Uh, we talked a little bit uh, before beginning. Uh, uh, so today we're gonna uh, discuss comparative cross-species transcriptomics for lifespan. Uh, by the way, do you hear me well? A little louder. Okay. Okay. So uh, I come from uh, the computational biology of aging group from uh, Institute of Biochemistry from Bucharest. Uh, I'm a junior bioinformatician there uh, and a medical student. So, um, yeah, multidisciplinary lab, has some team, uh, cool tools and models, or at least we hope so. Um, so the main topic of uh, our research uh, is aging, and uh, the tools that we use to research it uh, uh, come from bioinformatics. So uh, as an overview of what we're going to talking today. Uh, first, I'll, I want to shortly introduce the Gerontomics project, which is uh, the main project uh, of our group. And then we're going to speak about cross-species project, which is a sub-project uh, in which I'm uh, involved and uh, which is led by uh, Anton Kulaga, which some of you uh, know. So uh, regarding the Gerontomics project, uh, the shortest cool description that I could uh, think of would be surfing omics data for prioritizing gerontological interventions. So let's go through it uh, one word, one by one word. So surfing omics data, because there are a lot of omics data from sequencing experiments today, and uh, we want to explore them to come up with uh, insights for prioritizing gerontological interventions. Gerontological interventions are interventions like gene modifications that increase lifespan. And we need prioritization because there could be a lot of genes that could be involved in longevity. And checking them one by one is the way to go, but it's a slow and uh, less efficient way. So there is, in the current scientific community, there is a need of a method to prioritize interventions so that we uh, could uh, go the fastest way towards uh, efficient gerontological interventions. So all of this uh, is related to GeneAge database, uh, which is uh, a database uh, created by a team led by uh, Takutu Robi, uh, our group leader. Uh, this database contains genes that have been experimentally validated to be involved in longevity extension uh, in uh, various model organisms. Uh, so the next question is, can you do combinations of genes? Okay, so you would like to modify, uh, knockout, perform knockout on two or three genes, for example, and you want, uh, you want a great increase in longevity. So, and here comes the idea of synergies. So, Combining interventions rarely has an additive effect. If we uh, look into these uh, schematics, uh, if you see the, the lifespan extension of gene 1 and you have a lifespan extension of G2 individually, separately, you want to look at the G uh, lifespan extension when you modify both G1 and G2. Uh, and you can have various outcomes, right? You can have purely additive effects, when you just sum the difference in lifespan uh, determined by each of them individually, you could have synergy, which is what uh, Gerontomics project is looking for, where the effect is actually higher than the sum of the individual effects. So predicting synergistic interventions is one of the main goals of, uh, of the Gerontomics project. Uh, why is this? Imp this is even more important because if you count the number of combination of genes, it gets uh, it, it explodes. You get a huge number of genes. So if a human genome has an average of twenty thousand genes, and you count combination of two genes, you have uh, about two hundred million combinations. So you can't really check each of them. It's it's a waste of time. So uh, you need ways to predict which one of them has higher chance a priori to, to yield uh, synergistic uh, effects. So in the great picture of things, uh, there is a lot of age-related data uh, in today's uh, 
uh, scientific databases. There are different kinds of omics data coming from genomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, proteomics, and drugs. Uh, and we try to look into each of them, besides proteomics and drugs currently, but definitely in the future. And one, when one does uh, aging research, one looks into different models of aging. You can look at old versus young. You can look at long versus short-lived mutants. And you can look at species with different lifespans. So in the great picture of things, the cross-species project that we will be talking uh, on well, from now on uh, examines transcriptomics data, which comes from RNA-seq, and examines cross-species comparisons, right? Species with different types. So data is growing, so let's analyze it. <laughs> so cross-species uh, transcriptomics for lifespan-associated genes and processes. So I would like to review the goals. Then we'll look into uh, databases. Where do we get the data from? Then we'll look into the bioinformatic quantification pipeline for uh, mRNA-seq. Then we'll look into differential expression and uh, the main and probably the most interesting part in the data analysis process itself. So some goals of the cross-species project is to identify sets of genes associated with the uh, high lifespan. Then, uh, the next logical step is to find biological process specific to high lifespan uh, mammals, uh, from which you can get biological insights and findings that you can translate to human longevity. As stated in the outline, we'll begin with uh, where do we get our data from, because we don't do experiments currently, uh, sequencing uh, high throughput experiments in our lab, so we use public databases. So. The transcriptomics, or the mRNA-seq data, we get from SRA, which is uh, one of NCBI's big databases, single uh, read archive. Uh, then, when you do the pipeline for mRNA-seq, you need species genomes, because you have the, M, uh, the reads that you will need to map to, somewhat, to some reference uh, transcriptome or genome, depending on uh, how you do it. So for this, uh, we use Ensemble, uh, which, has, uh, which is also a big player in the field of uh, bioinformatics databases. From Ensemble, we also look into orthology, because when you compare genes from, let's say, 20 mammals, you can't compare all of them. You need to compare just the ones that got conserved across all of the 20 species. And for this kind of uh, information for orthology, we also use Ensemble. Two other resources that we use for somewhat different purposes but are also part of our projects is the GTX portal and Arch S4. GTX portal has both sequencing data and uh, phenotypic data from human samples. So you can get, for example, genomes, you can get transcriptomes uh, along with phenotypic data like tissue, uh, death type, age, I don't think we have mass but uh, stuff like this. Uh, th this will be useful for a later step, um, which we'll get to it later. Uh, and we'll talk about artists for later as well. So we explored the SRA databases for experiments on mammals, on different organs, uh, and that's what we got. If we looked by organs, uh, yeah, we chose uh, five organs that had uh, uh, that had been sequenced in most species. Uh, so if you see, we had lung, heart, brain, liver, and kidney. And for most of for for most of them, we have more than for all of them, we have more than fifteen uh, species, and they're overlapping uh, overlapping species. Meaning that uh, I don't know the seventeen species of lung, you can find them in all of uh, you can find these organs for all of them. So, uh, and if you look at species, we have. Uh, five organs and uh, 29 species, and for most of them, we have more than two uh, organs. Uh, yeah, uh, an interesting aspect is that, uh, what, what other organs do you, would you, okay, so we would also expect other kind of organs to be often sequenced, like skin, because skin is easily accessible, right? Like, 
like muscle, skeletal muscle. But actually, and for genomics, they actually do sequence a lot of skin because it's easy accessible. But for transcriptomics, people are not so much interested in transcriptomics of skin. So it's, uh, it was actually interesting to find out that uh, you, you don't find a lot of samples of skin uh, for transcriptomics data. Uh, okay. So this is also a nice uh, resource where uh, you can get actually evolutionary uh, data in uh, years, in million years, for the species that we analyze. And uh, uh, I'm not an expert in phylogenetics, but uh, you can also get data on some uh, important uh, conditions, environmental conditions uh, across history, evolutionary history, which may be correlated with some features and so on. So uh, do recommend the resource. Uh, so, regarding data collection, I mentioned ortology that we get from ensemble and uh, why ortology is important, coming back to it. So if you're looking at a branch or a part of an uh, evolutionary tree, we have speciation events, where a species basically forms, right? You get from an ancestor to two new species. And here, if you see uh, species A, species B, and species C, uh, you can have several relationships uh, between genes in different species. You can have ortologs when you have the same gene uh, in different species, like the green and the blue one here. You can have paralogs where you can see that only in species C there has been a gene duplication event. And uh, here we have paralogs, this kind of relationship. And you can also have, uh, as stated in this illustration, co ortologs where there is a relationship between a gene in a species and a par and paralogs in other species. Uh, there is another classification of the same kind of relationships where this kind of relationships when you have one gene in species A and one gene in species B is called one-to-one -one ortholog. And when you have this kind of relationship, you, you call it one-to-many ortology. Now, when, when we did our analysis, this was actually a problem. Because how do I know uh, which gene expression of the blue gene how do I know to which gene should I compare in species C? To the red one or to the yellow one? Because they're all similar in a sequence. And ortology is, uh, uh, is actually uh, declared or defined in terms of uh, sequence similarity and alignment scores. So what we did and what most uh, people do when they do cross-species comparisons, they look only at one-to-one -one ortologs. And when you look only at one-to-one -one ortologs for 29, spe 29 species, you actually get about uh, 4,200 4, genes. So from, for example, human has about 20,000 genes, but we can look only at 4, 000, about 4,000 of them because you don't find orthologs of humans in all the other species. So that's a limitation of our study because you, can't, you don't look at all genes. You look just at the subset of And you hope that in this subset you may get something interesting. So... This illustration uh, also shows some kind of relationships, like like one to one, right? One to one, one to one between three species. Um, okay. Okay. So we went fast through data sources. Now to the next step. Once you get the data, uh, there are a lot of tools to get data from SRA, like uh, command line tools, and you can also do it via web-based tools. Then you get the raw data, which is in a fast queue format, there on the left. And you need to quantify it, because at the very end, you want to get a table where you have 29 columns, say, for each species, and 4,000 rows for each gene. And you have a value that uh, should display the expression uh, or the activity of that gene uh, in, a, in a species, in an organ, and so on. Uh, for that, we use uh, the quantification pipeline that we use. Uh, uses basically Salmon. FastP is just for quality control and some pre-processing, like uh, trimming and adapter cutting. Uh, Salmon is a tool that's, uh, as they describe it, highly accurate and weak fast transcript level quantification from RNA-seq reads using lightweight alignments. So uh, according to the description, highly accurate, fast, transcript level so that 
you can actually look at transcripts. We don't look at transcripts. We look at only at gene level. Uh, and using light white alignments. And this is important because often you don't have a lot of computational resources to perform analysis. Uh, so, and Salman provides a relatively light so a solution for, for doing this. Um, okay, one more issue to discuss is uh, normalization. Normalization is a step in uh, data pre-processing where you try to reduce the, technic the technical uh, noise from biological noise, which may actually be biologically relevant uh, stuff. For this, there are various uh, procedures, and we use DPM normalization because it considers gene length, and genes in different uh, mammals have, may have different length, well, most probably will have different length. Yeah, we can discuss also this later. So, regarding the implementation, we use uh, Widdle and uh, Cromwell Execution Engine. Uh, as uh, they also describe it, it's a finally a workflow language meant to be read and written by humans, designed by our beloved Broad Institute, which uh, builds uh, highly efficient and uh, user-friendly tools for bioinformatics. Uh, Widdle is a workflow language, which means that it's a programming language which is designed for building workflows, which are nothing else than uh, procedures that goes, go in a sequence, a sequence of procedures, basically. Uh, Cromwell is the execution engine that actually implements that stuff that's written into a Widdle script. And uh, it is also uh, one more important and the aspect of it is the, that it's that it can be integrated with stuff like Docker, which, uh, which, is the, which is often used in bioinformatics and not only. A Widdle uh, script has a simple structure because it was designed to be read and written by humans, not computers. You just write a name for your workflow. You call some tasks, which you define later in your script. And you define them by giving the command which you would write on the command line and specifying the outputs and you also need to specify how they relate to one another. So if you want to build reproducible, fast and uh, scalable bioinformatic pipelines, Vidal and Cromwell uh, is, uh, is a good solution for this. So regarding differential gene expression, once you have normalized, for example, TPM values, uh, you can do differential gene expression for finding genes that are expressed in a statistical sense differently in different species. In our case, the differential gene expression analysis has several issues, and we actually didn't use it a lot. Uh, first, when you usually do differential gene expression analysis, you have just two samples, control versus treatment, and you have replicates, like three replicates, or three replicates, right? Here you have multi-sample, basically, 29 species times five organs. Uh, a single replicate because it's hard to find, rep you, it's easy to find replicates in human. There are a lot of human livers uh, sequenced. Mm. It's harder to do it for uh, naked mole rat or other kind of uh, mammals. And it's highly sensitive towards normalization method. So we used the uh, RN entropy, which is uh, uh, it's uh, not the most highly popular tool for doing differential gene expression, but uh, it's feature that allows analyzing multiple RNA-seq experiments, multi-sample experiments, uh, is an advantage that uh, we chose to, to use. So, um, yeah, in, in, for those of you that are acquainted with uh, statistics, it's based on relative entropy or KL divergence, uh, which is the target to be maximized in maximum likelihood estimation. And it's similar to performing a goodness of fit test for a discrete distribution. So usually you assume that the, the discrete distribution usually is assumed to be normal. You assume that you have, a, in a null hypothesis, you assume that you have a uniform distribution across all species, and then you test for a goodness of fit test against it. And uh, if the test 
has and doesn't have a significant p value, it means that you don't have differential gene. The gene is not differentially expressed. Otherwise, it is. Okay. So you can get heat maps, cluster maps actually, because here you have. This is the heat map, but it's actually a cluster map because you also have clustering of uh, samples and, and genes. Um, sometimes you may spot nice patterns uh, by such kind of plot, but uh, for this to usually work, you need to have really uh, a lot of replicates and clearly defined uh, groups, which is not our case. And you need to do it after you somehow selected uh, fewer genes. It's not really useful when you have 4,000 rows here. Um, in our case, most genes are differentially expressed because uh, mammals are quite different um, uh, among them. Okay. So uh, we have uh, normalized TPM values. Now we need to analyze them. And that's where the data analysis process comes. Uh, we'll review the objectives that we have in data analysis and data that we have at hand. Uh, next, we usually do preprocessing, uh, normal, uh, further standardization, normalization, uh, exploratory data analysis to get a feel of the data visually. Uh, and then we'll talk about what we specifically do to obtain sets of genes that uh, may be uh, associated with uh, lifespan. And then we'll talk of some applications that may lead to translation of our findings to, to human longevity. So to review the data that we have, we have uh, 29 species, uh, for some of them five organs, for most of them more than two. We have TPM values, which are normalized the gene expression values. We have uh, 4,280 genes, which are, uh, I've stated that we look at only one-to-one -one orthologs, not to get uh, uh, overcomplicated with orthology relationships. Uh, we further use uh, log to normalization and scaling. The reason why we did log to normalization is that uh, for statistics, for some statistic procedures to work well, uh, you, some statistics procedure assume the data to be normally distributed, uh, which may not be the case. When we looked at, uh, and this is actually, this is known, the TPM values are actually not normally distributed. And uh, log to normalization, uh, is a transformation that actually gets them more or less normally distributed, which can actually be tested by, uh, there are tests for testing uh, the, these normality assumptions like Kolmogorov or Smirnov or uh, other goodness of each test. Scaling is also done because um, scaling is done to center your data and to, uh, to make it on a comparable scale. For example, if you compare lifespan and mass, lifespan in our case would be like from zero years up to 120 years, while mass, if you measure it in grams, can go from a few grams for small mammals up to uh, thousands and hundreds of thousands of grams for big animals like horses and uh, big uh, horses, right? So, and they're differently big numbers and you want them to be on similar scale. Otherwise, uh, uh, machine learning and statistics may not work well. Yeah. So, uh, regarding an example of uh, exploratory data analysis that you can do is to look at the relationship between lifespan and mass for different species. And uh, previous research has clearly shown that uh, uh, mammals with bigger mass uh, live longer. Now, uh, this uh, relationship is uh, on a species level. This doesn't, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, um, an obese human lives longer than a non-obese one, but on a species level, uh, species with higher mass may live longer. And that's related to a couple of facts and uh, uh, a part of this effect is uh, genetics, but most of it, uh, it's environment. environment. Bigger mammals uh, can fight off predators better. They're scarier and so on, more resources. Uh, 
What's good about this kind of plot, it's called the joint plot, besides showing the this scatter scatter points, right? It's it on, on the margin it shows the histogram of, of each variable. And uh, you can notice here that um, for mass we have a relatively nice distribution. While for lifespan, you see that here it's relatively okay, but here we have a single point that has such a big lifespan, and this is Homo sapiens. Uh, and that's another limitation of our study because you actually don't have a lot of uh, mammals of long-lived uh, mammals that have who, whose transcriptome has been sequenced. And so the conclusion that you get from such a study are not really generalizable to all long-living mammals, but mainly to humans because they're the single uh, long-living mammal in this example, right? And that's a limitation and an issue to be solved. Basically, people need to sequence more long-living, need to do transcriptomics for more uh, long-living mammals. Okay, another thing that you can do uh, is do dimensionality reduction to get uh, a feeling of how your data uh, is uh, distributed. Uh, so one, in uh, one interesting thing that uh, is noticed here, so this is the same plot, it's just colored differently to search for a relationship. This is called fishing for, for, for patterns. And uh, uh, you can actually see that in terms of uh, gene expression values, uh, the samples get grouped uh, by organ. You see a nice structure here, and not by species, which kind of makes sense from a biological point of view, because you would expect human liver to be more similar to, hu to cat liver than human liver to human kidney, or human liver to cat kidney, and, and so on. You probably get the point, right? Uh, an interesting thing that uh, we noticed at some point uh, uh, was that we had a similar structure, and then we had here a blue point. You know? And um, these are the kind of uh, things that you don't expect. And actually, what we think happened in that case is that the sample was mislabeled. And uh, this is again important because when you do this kind of analysis, you didn't get the get data yourself and you depend on the, quali the, the quality of the date of the owner of the data, in this case, NCBI SRA. So if someone uploaded data on SRA and mislabeled the sample, typed kidney in lot of liver, in, instead of liver, right? it gets you issues like this. So we then dropped that, that sample and got a new one and th things got well. Yeah, uh, this is another uh, algorithm for dimensionality reduction called TSNI. Has some advantages over PCA, but uh, in this context, it actually shows similar kind of stuff. Okay, uh, let's then now get to the feature selection part, uh, which was the main uh, uh, part of uh, our work in this uh, project. Uh, feature selection uh, is the problem of finding, uh, in this case, features are genes. So not to, not to confuse you, in, in, in our context, feature, uh, feature equals genes. So uh, in this context, we want to select genes that have the highest chance to be associated with uh, long lifespan in different uh, mammals. So. Uh, most of the uh, inspiration we got from this article, which describes uh, met uh, describes and compares methods for uh, for performing feature selection on high dimensional data, which basically means a lot of rows and a few columns, or depending. So one way you can do feature selection is to have a simple ranking approach, which we'll describe now. Uh, you can have a linear model where you describe the outcome, uh, in this case, lifespan of, uh, of a sample of a species by a linear, a li linear combination of genes with some whites plus an offset. And then uh, there are various algorithms for finding this whites. It's, it's, uh, it's basically linear regression, but uh, uh, a little bit uh, with some additional features. It's called SVR from uh, support vector uh, regression. And then you can take the score for each, for each gene. You can take the score. And uh, the higher the magnitude uh, of the coefficient, uh, 
the, uh, the greater the correlation is of that variable with the, with the uh, target variable, in our case, with lifespan. So uh, you can get uh, Wi for each gene, or white for each gene. You can then, you, you take the absolute value because uh, they may be correlated or inversely correlated. Uh, then you rank them, and you have a ranked list of genes, right? Higher, the higher up uh, in the rank, the, the more correlated that gene is with, uh, with lifespan. And then you select a, a cutoff threshold and you take, for example, like the top 100 genes. From it. This is a simple, uh, the simple approach. Then you can do the ensemble, uh, an ensemble approach. Ensemble is a term that's used in, uh, ensemble is a term that's used in uh, machine learning for, uh, uh, for the approach in which you take uh, the results of uh, various algorithms or the same algorithm with some variation and you aggregate them somehow. In our case, what you can do is that you have the training data, which in our case is a big table of 4,000 genes across, uh, uh, across samples from all species, and then you can undersample it or resample it. I think that's called bootstrapping. So from those, uh, we had 140 samples. You sample, for example, 100 of them. Randomly sample 100 of them, and you get you get a number b of, of bootstraps. Then you perform the same algorithm that we described earlier on each of them. So you get a ranked list of gene for each of the bootstrap, and then you need to aggregate them somehow into a single list called ensemble list. And then you do the same. You select a threshold, for example, top 100 genes, and and you look at that. Now there are some parameters in this procedure that we can adjust and play with. We can adjust the number of bootstraps. We can take two, we can take three, we can take hundred and so on, right? We can adjust the bootstrap size, how big a bootstrap we take. Uh, and we can play with the aggregation method, right? Like how we, how we combine all these lists. And a simple way to do it is just to do an average. Right? You will have ranks for each, uh, for each list from each bootstrap, and you can just take the average rank across each of them, and then re-rank them based on that value. Uh, and, that's, uh, and that's what we did. This is one way of, do this is one way of doing feature selection. You can, uh, there are actually hundreds of ways of doing it, and uh, it's hard to know which one of them uh, would perform better. The performance also depends on the kind of data that you have, on the dimensionality of your data, of the number of samples. We actually have a few, very few samples for machine learning. It, it, you can't even call it machine learning in that, uh, 140. Uh, samples. Uh, so uh, I described just one method. We actually tried some others, uh, like SVM uh, with the recursive feature uh, elimination. Uh, we tried tree-based methods like uh, XGP Boost and others. And uh, you need to evaluate them somehow. You need to compare them. Like, how do you know which which one of them performs better on uh, on our data set, for example? And you can evaluate them on a few on, on different. Uh, by different ways. First, you can evaluate them on predictive performance. So if you're talking about a simple linear regression method, you can look at how good uh, the line uh, fits the data, right? With such, uh, with, for example, things like R, R, R squared coefficient. You can also look at its predictive performance, like how, how accurate is it? How predictive is it? With, uh, with things like uh, mean squared error, I mean absolute error. And, and, and this is commonly done, this is not, uh, in, uh, this is commonly done. But what else you need to do in this case is to evaluate them, compare them by uh, stability. And stability, uh, mean, by stability I mean, uh, so we perform, we perform this procedure in each bootstrap and uh, you would like that, you, you would actually uh, like your algorithm to be consistent, meaning that uh, you want the same, more or less the same ranking across each bootstrap, that would be the ideal scenario, right? To have the same list, the same ranking, no matter the bootstrap, right? Uh, and then, that, that, therefore, you need somehow to measure the consistency. You need, to, uh, you need to, a way to measure how, how, how consistent they are, how, how equal they are in terms of, of lists. So, uh, one way to do it, is to measure the sets overlap, All right? If you have two sets, for example, A and B, you can measure 
how much they overlap by dividing the area of intersection by the area of the union, right? This is one way, or this is the most fundamental way of doing things. They're actually uh, more uh, more complex and uh, better ways of doing it, but but that you, you get the gist of it. And you do this for for this list gotten by different uh, methods, and that's why you can uh, that's how you can compare them. So you want a method with uh, high stability and also high performance, right? Because if it has high stability but no performance, it's, it doesn't make anything interesting. So uh, and there could also be a trade-off, right? You could trade for predictive performance by uh, losing stability and the other way around. That's what they actually did in the article that I was uh, showing earlier. That's why they did in actually in this article. Uh, they analyzed the stability and predictive performance of various uh, feature selection uh, algorithms uh, in multiple domains, not just medical applications. Right? Uh, okay. So uh, uh, that's uh, the main part for feature selection. Uh, one other thing that uh, we're looking into is uh, uh, phylogenetic generalized uh, least square regression. And uh, the motivation for doing this uh, is that when you look at species features like lifespan, mass, temperature, right? These are features of a species. You may see correlations between uh, these two from two main causes. Either lifespan, uh, for example, lifespan and mass. You can have either lifespan and mass are indeed correlated, indeed higher lifespan correlates with higher mass, or just the species are related. And this is an ambiguous statement that I'll try to uh, to, to explain on the next slide. Uh, so uh, it's a, a bad resolution from my side. Uh, here you have the structure of the phylogenetic tree of the species that we analyze. And here you have a, a color map of uh, lifespan and mass for each species, okay? And uh, what you could see is that uh, species that are close in terms of evolutionary distance actually have similar uh, values for lifespan and for mass. Like you can see here a block, you can see here a block, you can see here a block, right? That, that's a visual argument, but, uh, but, but the point is that when you do simple regression, you assume that each of these points are independent, independent points, data points, which is actually not true. Because this, uh, this will correlate with the lifespan and mass of their common ancestor, right? So, and if, if, if we were to count, for example, here, we will have uh, less than 29 data points. So which data points should we take? Which one should we analyze? The conclusion is that you can't treat, you can't treat each of these data, data points as, in, as independent because they're not. They're actually related to, in terms of evolutionary distance. So uh, I'll go back. You need uh, lifespan maybe uh, correlated uh, with mass. This is just an example to have the discussion, right? Because they are really correlated between themselves or just because uh, from this, com this may come just from phylogenetics. And PGLS regression is a way to control the p-values for, 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 for the phylogenetic relations. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, I'll skip this. So, yeah, uh, this is a relevant example, I think. Um, so if we so if we ignore all of this, if we look just at this plot of uh, y versus x of versus mass, for example, uh, we may notice a trend. Okay, there is there, there is a trend here. Uh, but if we actually do the this is a simulation. This is not a real species. If if you look at the phylogenetic structure of the species involved in in these data points. You actually see a, a, a very specific structure. You see that the first 20 species have a common ancestor, close common ancestor, and you can see that the next 20 species have, have also a common ancestor before, before sharing the common ancestor of, of all of the 40 species. And if you color, uh, if you 
differentiate them by, by shape, you actually see that if you look only at the first 20 species, right? For example, this half, there is no trend, it's, it's, it's random. If you look at just these 20 points, for example, the, the uh, is, uh, stars, it's also, it's, 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 not, it's not a trend, it's mostly random. So it's a, there's actually no relationship between y and x in this, in this case. It's, it's a false correlation. Uh, the method that I was uh, introducing, PGLS, uh, gives you a way to control, control for this. Because if you look just at simple correlation, you, you get a false positive. Uh, without getting too much into too much details about the method itself, uh, we do uh, use it now to confirm or infirm uh, the relationship uh, with lifespan uh, of the genes that we get from the previous procedure of uh, feature selection. Okay, yeah. Okay, uh, so we get a set of genes that may be associated with lifespan. Uh, now, what, what's next? Well, one thing you, you, you can do uh, is trying to build an uh, age predictor from gene expression data for humans. So for humans, from gene expression data, uh, and uh, use uh, for predicting age just uh, the top 100 genes, for example, that we got from our feature selection method. And it, if the performance of such a predicting system, predicting system is good, uh, this may mean that the genes that got outputted by the feature selection uh, uh, method may be useful as aging biomarkers uh, in humans. We do this with the neural network, and uh, we're still experimenting with it. But that's, that's the gist of it. So, uh, yeah, during the, uh, uh, during the talk, I actually mentioned uh, the limitations to review sample size, normalization methods, topology constraints. Uh, one that I didn't mention is uh, intergene correlations. So what has been shown uh, multiple times is that actually the gene expression in different conditions of multiple genes is uh, often uh, highly correlated, right? And if you're trying to predict uh, age from gene expression, and you have, for example, a mod, uh, maybe 100 genes that are highly correlated between themselves, uh, a lot of algorithms will just randomly choose one of, it, one of it. But maybe the other one is, is the one that's biologically significant. So, so that's, uh, that's a big issue of how, to, of how of handling uh, intergene correlations. So uh, a solution or uh, one idea to, to look into this is to use uh, network biology uh, and bioinformatics of it and trying to predict lifespan not from gene expression values itself by, but by an acti the activity of a gene module. And that's one way of, of dealing with this. The, the others uh, as well. Uh, what you can also do and should do uh, if uh, you remember the second uh, goal of our cross-species project is to find biological processes uh, and biological insights into, into high lifespan, uh, 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 specific to high lifespan mammals. And you can do this with uh, uh, various methods for enrichment analysis, where you, ser you search for biological processes or pathways uh, that are uh, enriched in the genes that got in the, for example, top 100 genes uh, outputted by the feature selection. And uh, uh, these are not uh, f final results. For this, uh, by the way, we used, uh, there are lots of resources for this. We use WebGestalt, uh, nice interface. Uh, various methods for uh, for enrichment. Uh, at different points, we got different interesting results. Uh, um, a lot of them are uh, stuff that you expect to get, such an analysis like fat acid metabolic processes and uh, metabolism in general, because the metabolism of different mammals is different and uh, it probably is associated with lifespan. Uh, at some point, we also got a lot of um, mitochondrial stuff, mitochondrial related processes. Uh, and and uh, uh, pathways like mTOR signaling pa pathway, which is uh, actually known to be involved in human uh, longevity and, uh, and aging. Yep. 
So that's that's it with uh, with my presentation. Just uh, a few take home points I would like to emphasize. We've gone through some data sources for cross species that we use for cross species analysis, but are actually useful for uh, out of bioinformatic analysis. Uh, I've gone through. Uh, I introduced Vidal and Cromwell for bioinformatic pipelines. Uh, introduced the methods for the problem of feature selection and uh, at least uh, the idea behind some of the methods to do it. And uh, phylogenetic generalized uh, least squares for uh, controlling the phylogenetic relationships when you're doing statistics on uh, species uh, features. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make my, I'll add some references that I forgot to add and uh, make this presentation available for you if uh, you want to review or read more about uh, uh, the things that uh, I presented. And uh, of course, I, I want to acknowledge uh, the team that I'm part of. Uh, our group leader, Robita Kutu, uh, our uh, cross-species project leader, Anton Klaga, and the other members uh, of the team that uh, are uh, involved uh, in it. So uh, uh, before saying thank you, uh, I'll wait for you to read the meme. <laughs> so I hope that uh, at the presentation, uh, my presentation today was not like uh, inviting toxicology to BioPython uh, conferences. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, please, questions. We can uh, review any slide, uh, go back to any slides and uh, discuss. Uh, can be an informal discussion. About the effects. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned synergetic effects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want me to. Yeah, let's go back. Yeah, because uh, uh, because usually you get this. <laughs> usually, when you um, uh, usually when you combine two genes, you usually want to get even this, because uh, you would expect that you would get just the sum of the two. But usually, when you do experiments, you actually get either zero effect or even you even decrease the. You don't you don't extend lifespan; you actually reduce it. When, for example, you, you may have. Uh, it, it, it does happen that you have two genes if, that, if modified by themselves, increase lifespan. But if you modify them uh, together, you can actually get lower, uh, re reduce the lifespan. So uh, you, you, it's cool to have synergy, but you want at least not to have not to have a decreased lifespan, which is not illustrated here. And uh, yeah, and uh, the system that's. Uh, uh, but currently, the system works. Uh, it's in implementation phase and the uh, scaling up phase. And uh, it's just an example, but you can do it by, for more than two genes. Uh, should work. <laughs> and, it, and, and it works, yeah. You also mentioned knockouts. Yeah, uh, not, uh, yeah. Knock out, you, of course, you can knock outs and you can do an activation. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. You, uh, you do activation of uh, pro longevity genes, and you, you can do, of course, knockouts or inactivation of uh, anti longevity. Or yeah. Can I ask question? Yeah, sure. Please. Yeah. About workflow languages, you use for the C. Yeah. Let me. You want? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to ask about uh, other workflow languages like uh, Cydia, common workflow yeah, language, yeah. and Snake Make. Uh, yeah. Because I, I used it in them, and I, and I think it's really great, great uh, things, uh, in opposite to Bash. Uh, but yeah. uh, what, what benefits did uh, EDL before? Okay. To other okay. Uh, I. Can answer this just uh, uh, so it's it's not the greatest answer because I didn't really work with the other tools that you mentioned. I heard about them. Uh, I don't know whether the other uh, whether the other tools uh, have easy Docker integration. Uh, Docker. Okay, uh, th this is cool because it's Docker easy Docker integration. Uh, 
as the Broad Institute uh, markets VDL, it's, uh, it's uh, more readable than the others. And it, it's uh, easy to write uh, even by uh, uh, scientists that don't uh, are into bioinformatics. It, it's designed to be really uh, human friendly. Please. Uh, did you use uh, the Brandon Forest uh, to feature selection? Yes. Uh, uh, XGPBoost X, X, X is uh, a boosted version. Yeah, well, we did. Uh, uh, but uh, it kind of didn't perform very well on predictive power because it probably just doesn't have enough samples. That's why we sticked at the end to linear methods. Okay. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. For yeah, I, I would recommend uh, edX. Uh, on edX, you can find a course on uh, offered by uh, MITx. It's called the Fundamentals of Statistics. Uh, this is for people that are really committed to this. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's uh, uh, relatively heavy math uh, and requires math background. Uh, calculus and uh, requires courses in probability and statistics. So first, first there should be a background in probability and statistics, and there are courses for that. Uh, prob prob probability, sorry, just probability, uh, and then and then you can go to understand better statistics. B without probability, you don't get the full picture of it, in my opinion, in my humble. Opinion. I, I would be sure that I have a background in calculus, uh, linear algebra, uh, probability, and then and then statistics. And then you can understand the machine learning and the neural networks as well. And, and you need statistics for, um, you, you, do, you can understand how it functions without much math, but uh, uh, for doing it, for evaluating its performance, you need to understand the statistics. For comparing different architectures of, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if, you want, if you are committed to this and want to go deep, uh, uh, you need to go through these steps. I went through these steps because I'm actually I'm a medical student and I learned all of these things. Yeah. Uh, thank you as well for coming. <laughs>